Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew, and my name is Anna. And you're listening to the Culips English podcast. Welcome back to Culips, everyone. Today we have a Chatterbox episode for you. And if you're new to Culips and you don't know what Chatterbox is, well, let me explain. It's our series for intermediate and advanced English language learners. That features natural English conversations between two native speakers about a fascinating topic. I'll be joined by my co-host Anna in just a moment, and we're going to talk today about the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, or the MBTI Personality Test. But before we get started, I want to let you all know that there's a transcript and study guide available for this episode for all Culips members. And I highly recommend following along with the guide as you work your way through this episode because we've created the guide to help boost your comprehension and fluency. So to become a Culips member and get unlimited access to the study guide for all Culips episodes, just visit our website culips.com to sign up. That's c-u-l-i-p-s.com. So our topic for today is the MBTI. Have you ever heard of it before? Have you ever done an MBTI test before? The Myers Briggs Type Indicator, or MBTI, is a set of questions, and by answering the questions, you can learn about how you make choices and how you analyze the world. According to the results of the quiz, you get placed into one of sixteen different groups. Now, these groups are called types. And the types are based on theories that were created by the psychiatrist Carl Jung in a book that he published in 1921, way back in 1921, called Psychological Types. The MBTI was developed by two women, Catherine Cook Briggs and her daughter Isabel Briggs Myers, during World War II. They initially developed the MBTI to help women who are looking to enter the workforce find jobs that would help them to have happy and productive careers. Eventually, the MBTI developed into its modern-day form around the early 1960s. The MBTI measures four things, and these are also known as the four dichotomies, and places people into one of 16 different. Personality types, depending on the results, all of the personality types are considered to be equal, and there is no one best type. So, what exactly are these four dichotomies that the MBTI measures, and how are personalities categorized? Let me walk you through it. The first thing that the MBTI measures is outlook, which is either extroversion (E) or introversion (I). Extroverts are people who like to spend time with other people and get their energy from the outside world. Introverts are people who like to spend their time alone, thinking and reflecting. Introverts get their energy from their inside world. The second thing that the MBTI measures is information gathering, and this is divided into sensing (S) and intuition (N). People who are sensing trust facts and tend to accept things that they can see, hear, taste, touch, or smell. But on the other hand, people who trust their intuition are more likely to trust information that really isn't dependent on the senses and can't be easily tested. They are more likely to trust hunches and go with their gut. The third measure is about decision making, and this is divided into thinking and feeling. People who make decisions alone and use their reasoning and logistic skills to make decisions are called thinkers. T. And on the other hand, people who seek harmony and consider all of the people involved in a situation and how decisions will affect everyone. Well, these people are more likely to be an F or a feeler. The final measure is judging and perceiving, and this is all about how we deal with others and perceive details and handle the outside world. Judgers use thinking and feeling when doing things, but on the other hand, perceivers tend to use sensing and intuition when doing things. 
So then when we put everything together and you finish doing your MBTI test, you get a four letter code, which corresponds to your personality type. For example, an ESTJ is a person who prefers extroversion, sensing, thinking, and judging, or an INFP is a person who prefers introversion, intuition, feeling, and perceiving. And there are 16 different letter combinations, different personality types that can result from doing the Myers-Briggs. So in a nutshell, that's what the MBTI is all about. And now let's welcome Anna to this episode and get started with our conversation about this psychological test and what our opinions of the Myers-Briggs are. Here we go. So Anna, let's talk about our MBTIs. Yeah, I'd love to. I absolutely love this topic today. And one thing I think is really interesting is that this personality test was developed by a mom and a daughter team. I, I don't know. I, I don't think I could ever imagine working with my mom closely like that when I was an adult. Could you, Andrew? I found that really interesting too. And I, I can't picture it. I can't ever imagine myself developing a personality test with my mom in this lifetime, at least. But it is a fun little fact about the MBTI that I think some people may not know about. Right. I could not imagine working with my mom like this. So I give credit to them for being able to produce something out of, out of that. But why don't we start with trying to guess what each other's profiles are or what each other's personalities are. Yeah, I think that is a fun way to do this, Anna. Before we just share with everybody what kind of results we got on the personality test that we did, we will try to guess each other's. So just before we started recording, Anna, I went over all of the 16 different kinds of personality types on the MBTI, and I was trying to imagine what one matches your personality best. And it was difficult, to be honest. There were several that I thought that you could fit into. But the one that I decided on is ENFJ. ENFJ. Am I right? You're wrong by one. You're oh. wrong with one of them. Only with one, though. And this is interesting because I tend to fool a lot of people because a lot of people think that I would be ENFJ, but I'm actually INFJ. I've got all of those. So you've done really well in those last three, but I'm actually introverted and not extroverted. But it can be a bit of a trick because sometimes when I'm at work, for example, or with you or with when I'm in a really comfortable situation, I think people perceive me as being extroverted. But actually, the reality is that I'm for sure, 100% introverted. And also, it's interesting to note that introverted, I think, has a bad rep because I think when people say introverted, they're like, oh, it means somebody that never says anything. They're super shy. And it could mean that. But for me, it's more about you need time by yourself. And being really, really social is very draining sometimes in some situations. So for your type, I think that you are pretty similar to me. I think you're an introvert from what you told me and the way that we know each other. So I think you might be more or less around my personality type. I'm definitely going to say introverted. Yes, I am. Do you know what? I'm going to say INTJ. We got opposite scores, Anna. I got three out of four and you got one out of four. Disaster. All right. Okay. So what's yours? So I am an ISFP. Ooh. ISFP, which I thought was a little bit surprising to me. You know, S stands for sensing, F is for feeling, and P is for perceiving. And if I had to guess just based on what those letters mean, I would say, no, I don't think I'm a very sensing or feeling person. But yeah, according to the test results, that's what I got. I actually did the test twice because I didn't believe it the first time. I thought, ah, I can't be right. So I waited a day and then did it again the next day when I kind of forgot all of my answers. And I got the same result both times. So I think there's something to it. 
Oh, I love it when people have different ones to me because then we can dissect and have a look at, you know, the different ones because I'm like, <laughs> oh, you're an S and I'm an N. Uh, but we do have the same with feeling. So this is about basing our decisions on personal values and how your actions affect each other. So we've obviously got a little bit of crossover there. And also we're both introverted, which I knew that I think from from what you told me before. And would you agree that it's like with introversion, it's not necessarily, I don't see it as like being a shy thing, but more that if I want to recharge my batteries, I need to be alone or have some time alone. Is that how you see that introverted or introversion thing? It's really hard to say. I do think there's that part of it, but I would say that I am an introvert, but I do like spending time with other people. It's not like a 100% of the time thing, right? There's some nuance there. So Maybe it's better to say I'm an extroverted introvert. I don't know if I could combine the two of them. I'm introverted in certain situations and extroverted in other situations. I think a lot of people would think it's kind of funny, Anna, that we are both introverted, but we have <laughs> a podcast that is listened to by many people and we go onto our Instagram pages and make videos and share them with people, that kind of thing. Traditionally, people wouldn't have seen as introverted behavior. So I guess in that kind of way, we are extroverted. But yeah, maybe that's more of the traditional way of understanding it. And it's more about how you get your energy. If you get energized by spending time with people or by spending time alone. And I definitely enjoy my alone time. Yeah, I'm a big fan of alone time. And I know like I sometimes with my personality, I know when I need to just have like a me day, we say. But I do think that my profile, because there's many different things that you can read about your profile. Um, and I do think my profile is quite accurate. And there's definitely some things that I think, wow, that does describe me down to a T. But there is the thing, and I mentioned this to you before, Andrew, that it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you do the test and you get your profile and then you think, oh, that's me. And I always have to be that way. And like you said, it's not always the case. And I kind of think of it as more of a spectrum. You know, you kind of, some days you might feel a little bit more on the extroverted end. And, and sometimes you might feel a little bit more carefree. Like I think in my profile, I'm very risk averse. You know, if I want to take a decision, I have to think about it a lot, rational, logical, but maybe there's some times that I'm I'm not like that as well. So I don't know, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I do think there is obviously some truth in, you know, everybody has different types of personalities and and different tendencies. But I think also that you can have a different result at different times in your life. I've always done it when I was at work as a way to like get to know the team and find out the other profiles in your team and how to work best together. You know, because if you have somebody who's, I don't know, a, a thinker and then you have the, somebody who's the opposite, you're like, okay, well, it's about understanding maybe how they're working and how you can work with them better. But I do know some people that have got different, different test results at different times in their life. So, but I think I've been pretty steady. Well, we were talking a little bit off air before we started recording about this topic, Anna, and I was saying how I kind of feel like I have different personalities in different situations, right? My Culips personality, maybe your Anna with two N's English personality is a little bit different than your personal personality, if I can say it that way, when you're spending time with maybe your friends or your family. And my work personality is different than my personal life personality, so... I think we sort of wear different hats in different situations. Now, there may be some core elements that are always the same, but I do think there is some room for fluctuation, for change from one situation to the next. Yeah, and it's whether those are actually different personalities or whether they they are all just aspects of your personality. You just use them at different points, you know, because I'm the same. I feel like my, you know, Anna with two ends had... I wear and my teacher hat and my coach hat, I wear that one as well. But it doesn't mean that I'm not that person. It's just that I feel like it's an aspect of my personality that I use in that situation because it fits best. And I think when you do things like podcasts and Instagram and it's more public, you do have this kind of hat that you wear and it's kind of like performing, you know, it's like you're, you're having to put on, I wouldn't say a show, but I still think it's part of your personality, but it's just a different part that you use for that 
thing, whatever, whatever it may be. But Andrew, I wanted to ask you, what part of your personality do you like the best? I know you said you didn't like agree with the profile. You're like, that's not me. I don't do that. But after reading it, what part do you like best about that profile that you have or the personality that you, you have? Well, I got some interesting results that came up with the personality test. It gave me an overall analysis of my personality. Now, of course, this wasn't a scientific test. I didn't meet with trained psychologists or anything. This was just like one of those things that you do on the internet in 10 minutes, just answering some basic questions. So I'm not going to say that my test results are in any way scientific, but I do think that they describe me to an extent. And... Some things that I liked about it was that I got uh, 0% on the psychopathy result, which was reassuring. You know, sometimes I, I feel like maybe I have my emotions buried too deep inside. And sometimes maybe I'm not as caring as I could be and not as empathetic as I could be. However, I guess I, as I get older, I'm getting a little softer, to be honest. But to see 0% there, that was just nice. One thing that I didn't like about my results was it said that I am statistically prone to stress 87% higher than the general population. Wow. So that is not great. Uh, also more prone to mental illness and neuroticism. So that's not great. <laughs> <laughs> not the best. No, I can think of, I think of better things. <laughs> not, the, not the best. 87% a higher chance than uh, the general population. But it did say that I'm 89% more organized than most people who do this. I, I don't know if that is true or not, but I guess I like organization and I like routine and I like habits and I like schedules. So whether I actually live by them or not, I'm not sure, but I do enjoy that. And that came out in my results as well. It also said that I'm very competitive, which I agree with. Maybe not competitive in a, a very direct sense, like in in life, I guess, or in my career, I'm not super competitive. But if I'm playing a game with somebody or I'm playing sports with somebody or I'm watching sports, I, I feel very competitive in that kind of situation. So I totally agree with that as well. Interesting. So I wonder where the stress and the thing comes from. Because I'm looking at the profile here. I'm like, why are you so prone prone to stress? Maybe it's paying attention to details and maybe are you a perfectionist, for example? I'm not exactly sure. Now, the test that I did, Anna, was one that I can share with our audience. I'll put the link in the episode description. It was an MBTI finder to find what type you are, but it also had some other questions related to different types of psychological tests built in as well. So I think maybe that was part of some questions that were outside of the MBTI, which gave me that result, I'm thinking. Okay. It's a good profile, Andrew. Don't worry. It's a good profile. I mean, all of them, <laughs> all of them are good. They're all very different. And it's it's nice to hear about different people's, I don't know how, how they are in their, in their different personalities, but I like the one about schedules, being organized and planning because I am so like that. I love a plan, whether I stick to the plan that can be, that's up for debate, but I love a plan. I love a schedule. One big thing for me is regarding planning is like traveling or going anywhere. I need to know the plan. I need to know where I'm going. I need to know what time the train is. I need to know where the train's uh, dropping me off or go going into. I just, those type of things, I'm kind of obsessive about that. So we're on the same wavelength with the planning stuff. That's so interesting because when it comes to traveling, I, I'm with you on the, I want to know where my train is leaving at what train platform at what time, all of those things, I'm with you on the same page. But that, that example of traveling is interesting because I kind of like traveling with no plans, having a kind of chaotic travel where I don't know exactly what's going on. <laughs> I don't do too much planning when I travel. Of course, when I'm going from point A to point B, I, I like to make sure that's organized, but I never make like a daily itinerary or something like in the morning, we're going to the museum. And then in the evening, we're going to this restaurant. I'd rather just kind of walk around and find some interesting things and let life happen to me rather than plan things out. Okay. 
which has caused some arguments with uh, past travel companions, to be honest. But it's my travel style. It's your travel style. It's your travel style. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't have like an itinerary of each day, but I have to say that when I'm like traveling, I mean the transport, like the idea of, mm. I know some people who are like, yeah, I'll just get to the airport like half an hour before. And I'm sort of like shaking. Oh yeah, that, like, that stresses me out. <laughs> that just stresses yeah. me out. <laughs> so yeah, I'm definitely a, definitely a planner. Um, I like scheduling um, and things like that. I agree with my profile more or less, as I said before. One thing I really like about the profile is the inner world. So this is one thing that it comes out a lot, that I have a very rich inner world. Maybe some of the listeners are like this as well, but I feel like there's a part of me that nobody will know, not even a partner, my family, my best friend. There's like always a little part of me that is like just for me. It's really hard to describe. I'm always thinking about things in my head. Like whenever I'm doing anything, I'm always thinking about X, Y, Z, I don't know, whatever. So I have a very rich inner world that is kind of just for, it's like a secret world. I, it's it's really hard to describe, <laughs> but that's one of the things that stands out for me in, in, in that profile that really rings true when I think about my personality and, and, and what I'm like. Yeah, that's interesting. I remember those kinds of questions coming up on the personality test asking me about imagination and inner world and, and that kind of thing. And it was a little bit difficult for me to answer them just because I don't have a standard. Like, it's hard to answer the question, like, are you a very imaginative person? It's like, do I imagine? Yeah. But am I more imaginative than you? <laughs> I have no idea, right? It's, I don't know where that standard is, how to compare. So those questions were really difficult for me to answer, but I guess maybe that indicates something, right? If you know very innately, like, yeah, I'm a really imaginative person. I have this world to myself that I feel like is my own, then you could really easily answer that question. And because I guess I don't, then Maybe that tells me something about my level of imagination. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's just one thing that, that stood out for me a lot. And they, they ask you lots of different, different questions. And we were talking about this that, you know, I mean, there are obviously criticisms about these types of tests, but I think they're, they're good at getting a kind of broad brush, you know, what are you like in some certain situations? And they can be actually really useful for figuring out, especially with people that you work with on teams, you know where they are and maybe the best way to interact with them or maybe why they might be reacting in a certain way that you don't understand because you might be like, I don't know why they always do this or I don't know why they find that offensive or why they're so sensitive about this. So doing these types of tests, I think, can be can be really useful, but also I wouldn't read too much into it. You have to be careful. Like I said before, self-fulfilling prophecy. You're, you are not your just your profile on on this test you know there's much more to you as a person than that but I do think I do love doing these types of things though any opportunity to do like a personality test at work on a team building day I was like yeah I'll do it I love it I think it's fun have you ever done one with a professional that was administered by a psychologist or a doctor or somebody who had a deep understanding of these kinds of tests yeah I have actually and I got the same result so I've done a very light version and I've done the really, really in-depth ones as well. And I've done other types of those different ones available that give you, you know, different things, but they're all more or less the same. It's just kind of how they package it. But yeah, I have done it with somebody quite thoroughly and it was the INFJ every time. So wow. yeah, I'm, <laughs> uh, I'm definitely, definitely in that, in that box. So stepping back just a little bit, instead of talking about our individual personalities, I wanted to get your perspective, Anna, on the MBTI itself, because the reason that we're talking about it here today is one of our listeners named Cheong. She wrote to us on Instagram, actually, and asked us to talk about this topic. And she is from Korea, and I know that it is huge in Korea. It's a, a very popular topic of conversation. Recently, I met a couple of friends and they were asking me about my MBTI. I've had my students ask me about it. Sometimes even in the English classes that I teach, my students will introduce themselves with their MBTI as part of their self-introduction. So it's extremely popular here in uh, Korea. I know that in Canada, it's also popular, but more for what like you were saying about team building or in the corporate world. But uh, I'm wondering, 
as someone who's living in Spain and as someone who's from the UK in these two countries, is the MBTI very popular? So based on my knowledge of the UK, because actually in Spain, I haven't worked in a company, a Spanish company. So my knowledge would be about the UK. But yeah, in the UK, it's super popular. And it's interesting that you mentioned that people use it as part of their introduction. Um, and it kind of becomes like a talking point, a discussion point, like, oh, which one are you? Which profile are you? You know, and you're like, oh, I'm an INFJ. What are you? I have heard that, that it people, some people really like to use it as a form of telling people who they are. But again, I think that can be, it's like a double-edged sword because you can say, oh, I'm this. And then people will react to you based on that rather than actually getting to know you and forming an opinion about you. Do you know what I mean? So if I say to you, I'm an INFJ, you're like, oh, Anna's introverted. So, you know, I don't know, maybe because people, <laughs> people always think introverted, boring, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. It doesn't mean that you're boring just because you're introverted. I think it has such a bad rep. So it's like good, but also I can see how people might change their reaction based on you saying that. Yeah, that classic definition of the quiet introvert is is not really accurate because uh, we are two chatterboxes here on <laughs> Chatterbox talking a lot. And we both said that we are introverted. And I, I like the expression that you used just a moment ago, a double edged sword. Could you break that down and just explain what that idiom means to everyone if something is a double-edged sword? Yeah, it's a great expression. And we use it a lot when we're debating topics. And basically what it means is that there's a good side and a bad side, essentially. There's a good thing exactly. and a bad thing. And it's a good one to know. And you'll notice people using it a lot when we're talking about different topics because normally things have something good and something bad. So it's a really nice way when you're debating with people to express what you want to say. Yeah. When we're comparing things, you know, sometimes it, it can be a little awkward to compare things in that kind of situation. You could say there's pros and cons or there's pluses and minuses. But personally, I've never liked that expression pluses and minuses. It sounds a little awkward, but a double-edged sword is a nice expression to use when something has some good points and some bad points about it, or when it can be helpful or hurtful, that kind of situation. So to finish up, Andrew, I thought it'd be interesting. We talked about what we like, but if you could change any aspect of your personality, what would you change? Well, now that I know that I walk around feeling more stressed out than most people, I think I would have to say that I want to change that. If I could um, not worry or stress out about so many things and take life maybe a little bit easier, that sounds pretty good to me. So that result was a little bit surprising. And uh, now that I know that, if uh, I could reduce the amount of stress or, or the impact of stress in my life, I think that would be very, very beneficial. How about you, Anna? What would you change? I wouldn't really want to change anything too much because if I change something, then it wouldn't quite be me. But I'd love to just see what it's like to be extroverted. I'd, I'd love to to try it and see what it's like um, on, you know, on a day to day basis. Yeah, I would change it for a day or a couple of days, maybe. Yeah, well, if we could do that, I think I would like to try on every personality type for a day and see what they're like. That would be really, really fascinating. <laughs> sure. Well, everyone, I think that brings us to the end. So we hope that you enjoyed this episode and were able to learn a lot with us here today. And nice job on getting in your daily dose of English listening practice as well. You guys are doing exactly what you need to do to improve your fluency. So keep up that good work. And also thanks again to Cheong for suggesting this topic. So Andrew and I talked about our MBTIs, but we're curious about you. We'd love to know your thoughts about the MBTI and personality tests. So visit our website, coolips.com, and you can leave a comment on the page for this episode and you can share your opinion with us and the rest of the Coolips community. This episode was made possible thanks to all of our wonderful members and supporters. And guys, if you enjoy Coolips and find it helpful for building your English skills, We'd love it if you could help us by leaving a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast app. 
You could also support us by following us on Instagram or YouTube or telling your friends who are learning English to check us out. You can also support us by becoming a Coolips member. There are tons of great benefits you get when you're a member, like study guides and transcripts for all of our episodes, plus much, much more. To learn more about all the details and to become a Coolips member, just visit our website, www.coolips.com, or check out the link in the description. We'll be back with another brand new episode soon, and we'll talk to you then. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>